Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of movement in our lessons this morning. I mean, in the Old Testament, an object is lowered from heaven before Jacob, and then in the Gospel account, a paralyzed man is lowered from the roof before Jesus. So what's going to happen? Well, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. From our Old Testament lesson again, Jacob sees the heavens open with a ladder coming down to earth. Angels, they flank both sides as Jacob is then reminded of the three promises that God made to Abraham, Jacob's grandfather. And what Jacob sees really... It shakes him. Fast forward to when Jesus is introduced to Nathaniel, who would later become one of Jesus' disciples. Nathaniel's the one who cynically asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? When he meets Jesus, though, it's like Nathaniel was just reading or thinking about Jacob's ladder. I... I, I tend to speculate, I know that's dangerous territory, but I speculate that Nathaniel's daily reading this morning is our same Old Testament lesson. Because out of the blue, Jesus tells him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So Jesus, if Nathaniel was a pious uh, Jew, and he was reading the scriptures. I'm sure Jesus was too. And so Jesus informs Nathaniel that the ladder that Jacob saw was, in fact, Jesus. Which shakes Nathaniel up too. Now, when you fast forward once again, Jesus has scarcely entered into town before everybody finds out. There would be no rest for the Son of Man until he found it at the grave of Joseph of Arimathea, and even that, that wouldn't be a long rest at all. Within a short period of time, the house he is in is filled with folks, and no doubt sitting right in the front were the religious leaders, those who always take the best seats. These religious watchdogs are there to criticize Jesus and, if possible, openly condemn him. For they were of another belief, another system of beliefs. Meanwhile, four men approach the house hauling their paralyzed friend. With the crowd so thick, the house so congested, a decision is made to open a space on the roof large enough to let their friend down into the chamber below. Right where Jesus sat. The others agree with, I assume, I assume the paralytic giving the thumbs up, like, okay, let's do it. Let's try it. And so this act took faith because you certainly don't want to go through all this trouble to get your friend close to Jesus because you think of Jesus as being unmerciful or unkind or unable to save. Well, mission is accomplished. Their friend now lies before Jesus as they seemingly look down from the roof and everybody else looks on. The expectation was for Jesus to make the man's legs work again, to get him to walk. But the man's outward trouble is not his greatest trouble. And if that is the thought that you can leave here with today, that's what I want you to leave with. His outward trouble was not his greatest trouble. His greatest trouble revolves around the sins piled up on his very soul. Those vile and offensive sins that ultimately would keep him locked out of heaven. So for Jesus, the soul must be dealt with first. And then the body. This paralytic is the perfect symbol of the inability of sinners to actually help themselves. He can't move a muscle. All he can do is receive what Jesus wants to give him. 
And with that, Jesus says, Take heart, my sons, your sins are forgiven, and immediately they are with me. You know, all churches have a liturgy. Some are more elaborate liturgies than others. Nevertheless, there is always, even in the most basic, rudimentary church you can find, there's always a liturgy. Now, in our liturgy, specifically Divine Service Setting 3, 4, and 5, we have our help is in the name of the Lord with the response, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So why, think about this, why would a verse about God making heaven and earth be included with a couple of verses dealing with confession of sin? Well, because how did God make heaven and earth? It was by the power of his word. And if he can make heaven and earth with the power of his word, what, beloved, do you think he can do with your sins? Praise be to God, he can cast them as far as the east is from the west. He can cast them so far they'll never be found again, so far that no one can possibly bring them back. So that is precisely what Jesus does for this paralyzed sinner who is laying before him. This, by the way, is why we sang that hymn when we began the service, all having to do with the forgiveness of sins. Jesus does this for him. This one who could do nothing to help himself. This one who can do nothing to cleanse his own soul. And as a result, now he is justified before God. He is righteous. He is absolved. He is forgiven in the present tense by the Son of God himself. All because Jesus says so. Now, to the ears of the Pharisees, these were strange words. The Pharisees, you may or may not know this, I hope you do, the Pharisees didn't place a lot of emphasis upon the soul. They cared more about the body. You remember how Jesus told them, you are nothing more than whitewashed tombs. Meaning you care about the outside, but you give no place for the soul, no place for the inside. Whitewashed tombs, he says, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones, all uncleanliness, he says. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his what? His soul. So this was a mind blower to the Pharisees for Jesus to be dealing with the man's soul. The law knew, such, knew, so, uh, knew no such form as an official forgiveness of sins, of someone pronouncing forgiveness. No human lips dare do that. Except one set of human lips. Did this authority to forgive sins ascend to heaven with Jesus after his resurrection? No. Absolutely not. The risen Lord Christ, the King of the universe, left that authority on earth. And you've already received it this morning. And you heard me say, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you of all of your sins, which means that you are truly forgiven, or literally, your sins have been loosed from you. Chains have fallen off. Your sins are Jesus's now, and he's not going to let you have them anymore because he's going to die, and he's going to take them to his tomb. The Catechism teaches us, I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, in particular when they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better, 
This is just as valid and certain, even in heaven, as if Christ, our dear Lord Jesus, dealt with us himself. Sure, I know the absolution, it sounded like me, like a redneck Kermit the Frog, but it was Jesus delivering what only Jesus can deliver. And so that which you are ashamed of, forgiven. That regret, forgiven. All of it. Nothing remains. Jesus' words of absolution is freedom. It's life. And you won't hear it anywhere else other than Christ's church. You will not hear words of absolution at First Baptist Church. Nor will you hear them at the hip, trendy, non-denominational church down the road. You won't hear an absolution pronounced there. You know why? Because they don't believe it. Yes, the word Bible might even be included in their name, but there's an essential part that they do not believe. They do not believe that Jesus has left this authority on earth to forgive sins through the lips of another. It just, it, it, it completely baffles me in that you can be in a relationship with someone who has hurt you, offended you, your brother, your sister, your greasy grandmother, whatever it is. You can be in a relationship with them. They sin against you. They come to you and they say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And you can say what? I forgive you. Christ forgives you, I forgive you. Somehow or another, I can say that to this other beloved friend or relative of mine, and we have no, we have no problem believe, believing that Christ has left the authority to forgive sins on earth. But somehow or another, when it comes to, I don't know, a corporate gathering, and a pastor stands up and says, I forgive you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, somehow or another, that's not just as valid? Folks, I get so worked up about this, as you can tell. I would drive to the Lutheran church on Saturday nights. I was an evangelical pastor. I had church on Sunday, but I would go to the Lutheran church on Saturday night. You know why? So that I could what? Hear. Faith cometh by hearing. So I could hear the pastor say, after I made a confession, what? I forgive you of all. Thank you. Thank you. So this is such a beautiful gift that the Lord has given us and most of us. We just take it for granted. When Christ absolves you through his called and his ordained pastors, this is one of the reasons why we take it for granted. Here's the question. Do you see anything happening? When that pastor pronounced forgiveness for me on Saturday nights in Wilmington, North Carolina, did I see anything happen? No, of course not. Is there any visible proof that my sins are, were now cast as far as the east is from the west? Is there any visible proof that God does not condemn you, that the law cannot convict you, that you are pardoned and your case is dismissed? Any visible proof? No. All you have is a word. All you got is a promise. Why is that? Because, folks, that's how God deals with us. Because we're to walk by faith, believing His promises. We do not walk by sight. And certainly we don't walk by how we feel in our hearts. Jesus was already thought of by the religious leaders as untrained, one who had usurped clerical functions. When Jesus made this pronouncement to this man, they thought that he had crossed the line into blasphemy himself. He's doing something that only God can do. He had intruded on the divine right, equating himself with the Almighty. And guess what? They were never more right. 
right spot on. In saying this, Jesus is claiming to be God. He, cl he is claiming to be the one to whom all flesh must give an answer, the one before whom every knee must bow, the one who can open the doors of heaven and who can sentence sinners to hell. To them, again, this was scandalous. But to us, folks, this is Jacob's ladder. Christ coming to us giving a sinner like you access to God through the forgiveness of sins. They even ask, who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, because a blasphemer was to be put to death by stoning. His body was to be hung upon a tree, and then he was to be buried with shame. Jesus knew they always put the worst construction on all that he said, and he did. But remember what Jesus is doing. It's first the soul, and then the body. Now look, how do we know that Jesus has authority over demons? Because he cast them out. How do we know that Jesus has authority over disease? Because he heals disease. How do we know that Jesus has control over nature? Because he settles it, he calms it. And how do we know that Jesus alone can forgive sins? Because after he forgives the paralyzed man, he then tells him to rise and to walk and to go home, and he does. The purpose of this healing miracle is to serve as a visible sign that they and you might all believe that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. So praise be to God, instantly sensibility and power of motion return, atrophied muscles they seemingly miraculously restore without rehab. Strength once again courses through the man's vein and the paralyzed man rises little by little with, I believe, his eyes fixed upon his deliverer till at last he stands up straight before him. First the soul, then the body. And then, by a look, Jesus motions for the man to leave. And lifting up his mat, he does, eyes still fixed upon his helper as he makes his way through the awestruck crowd. This is a turning point in the ministry of Jesus. For this accusation of blasphemy, it will not die. It is not going to go away. This charge that has been muttered in the heart of these religious watchdogs would only end at Calvary, and Jesus knew it. There, Jesus will die on the cross for the once paralyzed man, for the friends above who lowered him down, for the Pharisees even who hated him. He dies for you as well. Beloved, your greatest need is forgiveness. To obtain it, you didn't have to cut a hole in the roof this morning to get to Jesus. He is accessible to each and every one of you. And He is accessible through the waters of holy baptism, through the word of absolution, through the supper of His body and blood, and in His preached word. And only in His church does He give these things to you. Only in his church does he deal with your soul. But, final thought, it doesn't end there. One day, he will deal with your body. Just as he's promised. He's going to call it forth from the grave should he tarry, which is why we confess, I believe, in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Whose body? My body. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Again, first the soul, then the body. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.